Well, good morning. If we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Terry Lee. I'm one of the pastors here at the Oaks Church, and I'm really grateful that you're here, uh, whether you are a first-time guest or you call the Oaks Church home, uh, how great it is to be able to worship together, that uh, regardless of, of what is going on in the world or in your personal life, that our God is a, a, a place of stability, that he is a place of refuge, that his word is forever true. And so if you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and find Mark chapter 8. Uh, we're going to continue our study through the book of Mark. Uh, many of you know that our theme for 2022 as a church has been better together. We want to be better together by worshiping together, by growing together through discipleship and missional community groups and in our equipped classes. We want to be better together by serving one another, by serving our city, and ultimately living on mission together. And uh, I want you to know that as your pastor, it is also great to be a member of this church. Uh, many of you guys know that uh, this past week, my grandfather passed away, and so uh, we went down to Florida for a couple days and uh, got back in last night. Uh, and I want you to know just how much it's meant to me uh, for you to be praying for our family, uh, my grandma, who is married to my papa for 60 years, and uh, you know just the way that you've sent me texts, and uh, let me know that you're thinking of us. Uh, I want you to know that it is, it's great that God has made us better together. And so um, I just wanted to, to encourage you in that way as you guys have been a comfort to our family. Now, as we look at Mark 8, one of the things that we're going to consider today is what Christ says about counting the cost of following him. And I was reminded of a secret about our city, the city of Cincinnati, that you may or may not know. Now, if you go to many of the major intersections downtown, you will see uh, some large metal grates that are on the sidewalks, and you might not know what's underneath those. You see, Cincinnati is home to the largest abandoned subway system in America. You can kind of see some of the access points, actually, as you drive down the interstate. There are seven miles of subway system that travel all the way from downtown where Central Parkway is up to Norwood. I'm not making this up. You can like research it whenever uh, you leave here today. Now, maybe you're wondering, okay, if there's seven miles of subway system, why don't we have this booming mass transit system? Well, it seems that the project was started before they accurately counted the cost, and for that reason, they never made it to the end. You see, in the early 1900s, uh, what we know as Central Parkway was actually the Erie Canal. It was a waterway, and it had gotten pretty disgusting. People were just kind of using it as the city garbage can, and because of the rise of the automobile, you know, people weren't really using the waterway. And so the city voted, and they said, let's drain the canal, and we'll just put a subway system in. And so the projected goal was 16 miles of subway system, and the budget was $6 million dollars. Well, after about five years, they had seven miles, a little over half uh, accomplished. But then, you know, World War I, the Great Depression came, and seven miles in, and the funds were completely dried up after only five years. And so they voted to just scrap the project, and they could fill it all in with dirt, they could complete it, or they could just leave it as is. And that's the way that it has been since around 1920. Now, maybe you're sitting there wondering, what does this have to do with my life? Well, you see, because they didn't count the cost, we would never know what the city of Cincinnati would be like if we would have had mass transit in, in the 1920s. Could we be competing with, with maybe a city like Chicago, even though Cincinnati's better, right? Uh, we'll never know what, what Cincinnati would have been like because the cost wasn't accurately counted before the project began. And in the same way, we must count the cost of the Christian life. Maybe you are in this room and you're not yet a Christian and you're just kind of still peeking over the fence of Christianity wondering, what is all of this about? Maybe you're here and you've been walking with the Lord for a really long time. Or maybe you're sitting there and you're a new Christian. If you enter the Christian life or you continue in the Christian life with unrealistic expectations, you will find yourself confused bitter at God or on the verge of depression because Jesus invites us into an abundant life, but he never promises that it will be an easy one. And I know that as you sit there, you know this, you feel this because whenever I look around our church, I know that there are some of you who have been abandoned by your own family because you became a follower of Christ and left the religion that you grew up in. 
Some of you who are high school students or college students, you're torn between your integrity to not cheat on an exam like other students might to get a better grade than you would. You are, you're sitting there wondering, am I just gonna work hard like everybody, like everybody has, has just kind of abandoned so that they can get a better grade through cheating in this world of online classes? Or, or am I gonna believe that Christ is worth it and count the cost? For those of you who are single, you're sitting there and you're thinking, dating is so hard because my standard for a good spouse is godliness. And if I just lowered my standards of what I expect out of a future husband or wife, my life would be so much easier. Maybe you're sitting there and you just got a new job or maybe you're trying to bond with some of your coworkers and you're sitting there in the break room and everybody's gossiping about how just terrible your boss is. And you're thinking, you know what, this would be kind of the perfect way to, to interject and to be a part of this conversation. But instead, because Christ is worth it, you resolve to remain silent to keep your integrity intact and the reputation of Christ. Maybe you get to the end of the year and, and you get your giving statement for the Oaks Church and, and you look at it and you think, man, this, this would have been a down payment on a brand new car this year. And, I, and you're thinking, I give so much of my time, my treasure, my talents. And my invitation in this sermon is for each of us to count the cost of following Jesus and find that he is immeasurably worth it. You see, I believe that our church needs this sermon, myself included, not primarily because we are stingy people or because we are disobedient. We're not perfect by any means. But honestly, the Oaks Church is the most generous, servant-hearted, mission-minded, give you the shirt off of my own back kind of church that I've ever been a part of. But because that is true, I fear that we could easily sleep, slip into an attitude of entitlement, that we would lose sight of being grateful for what all that God has done. We could accidentally make our service to the Lord transactional and say, Lord, look at all that I've done. Now, this is what I'm expecting you to do. We run the risk of forgetting that through the blood of Christ, God lovingly owns us, but he doesn't owe us anything. So here's my prayer, the prayer that I've been praying for myself this week, and my prayer for our church, my prayer for you. Lord, help us to be awe-filled and overwhelmed at all that Christ has done to save us and to give us a relationship with God so that as we count the cost, whatever it might cost us, we will find Christ to be immeasurably worth it and we will follow him. The theme for our text this morning in one sentence is simply this, that we should count the cost of following Jesus and consider the immeasurable worth of walking with him. We should count the cost, eyes wide open, of following Jesus and then consider the immeasurable worth of walking with him. For some of you, this will be to persuade you that Christ is worth it. For others, it will be to remind you that Christ is worth it. And for all of us, it will fix our eyes on he who is king. Now, last week in the book of Mark, we saw that Jesus, he heals this blind man, but something interesting happens, right? He only heals the man partially. He takes his hands off of his eyes and the guy says, you know what, I, I can see better than before. I'm no longer blind, but people just kind of look like trees. Now, why did he do that? It's because Jesus is creating an analogy between that blind man who he gave partial sight to and then full sight to, to show the way that the disciples understood who Jesus was. At this point in the ministry of Jesus, we just saw Peter confess, you are the son of God, you are the Messiah. And Jesus says, yeah, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven, you are absolutely right. And yet what we're still going to see is that he only had a partial understanding of who Jesus truly was. You see, the Jewish conception of who the Messiah would be came from Psalm 2. He would be this great leader who would conquer the nations. He would not be oppressed, but he would reign. He would rule on a throne. And so they had this picture of who Christ would be as a conquering king but they often failed to see that he would also be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, as Kathleen just read, that he would come as king for certain, 
But it wasn't to spill the blood of his enemies, but to spill his own blood that his enemies might be saved. Yes, he would come, and yet his path to the throne would be stained with his own blood for our salvation. He is both eternal king and suffering servant. And so as we continue to read in Mark 8, we get a clarifying picture of who Christ is as he explains his purpose for entering into the world to the disciples. And he invites all of those who follow him to count the cost of following him. And then we'll see just, I mean, at the end of our time together, the beautiful paradox of following Jesus, that by worldly standards, we would lose it all. And in Christ, we would gain everything. So pick up with me in Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter And said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now let's pause there for a moment. We're going to look at this passage from a slightly different angle than we did last week. And I'm going to invite you over the next couple of minutes to consider the cross of Christ and his suffering. Consider the cross of Christ and his suffering. You see, the danger here for the disciples was to not understand what would happen, what Christ would do. And where you and I are, are, the danger for us is to forget what Christ has done, to forget what has happened. Jesus begins to teach them here that the Son of Man must suffer. And if we have a small view of the suffering of Christ for us, we will have a cheap view of the grace that saves us. We must see that Christ came and he suffered in our place. Psychologists have a a term that they call visual lethargy. Now, visual lethargy, even if you're not familiar with that term, you you can probably catch on pretty quick as to what it is. Sometimes you, you drive to work or you drive to school, anywhere that's familiar to you, and you're sitting there in the parking lot wondering, how did I get here? I don't remember anything about this drive. Uh, The buildings that have beautiful architecture that you pass by that once caught your attention, the landscaping and beautiful flowers that begin to bloom that that once kind of stirred your affections no longer seem to phase you. In the Christian life, we can become visually lethargic to the gospel. We can become visually lethargic to the cross, to, to the beating of Jesus, to his incarnation, to what he suffered in our place that he might save us. And so my desire is to fix our eyes on what Christ has done because honestly, our view of the suffering of Christ is often too small. I felt this as I was reading a book a, a couple uh, months ago with, with Connor, one of our other elders. And I stumbled upon this quote, and it caused me to pause and recognize that my view of Christ's suffering for me is far too small. Louis Burkhoff says this. He says, his whole life, speaking of Jesus, was a life of suffering. It was a servant life of the Lord of hosts, the life of the sinless one in daily association with sinners, the life of the holy one in a sin-cursed world. The way of obedience was for him at the same time a way of suffering. He suffered from the repeated assaults of Satan, from the hatred and unbelief of his own people, and from the persecution of his enemies. Since he trod the winepress alone, his loneliness must have been oppressive and his sense of responsibility crushing. His suffering was consecrated suffering, increasing in severity as he approached the end. The suffering that began in the incarnation finally reached its climax in the crucifixion at the end of his life. And then all the wrath of God against sin bore down upon him. You see, we are prone, as Peter was here, to lose sight of Christ as the suffering servant. That our view of Christ's suffering on our behalf is far often too small. And here Jesus speaks of three ways that he will suffer in our place. 
Look at verse 31. He calls himself the son of man. Now let me tell you why that is so significant. Because in Christ's humility and suffering, he became truly and fully human. He took on flesh in the incarnation. One of Christ's favorite titles for himself in his ministry was son of man because it reveals the depth of his humanity. He has eternally existed as the second person of the Trinity and the Son of God, and yet he submitted himself to his own commands by taking upon flesh, subjected himself to limitations. No other God of any religion becomes human to relate to man in order to save them. Only Christ has done this. Only he is the Son of Man. You see, he takes on this title because it also resonates with the prophecies from the mouth of Daniel in Daniel 2 and Daniel 9, that he is the one who would preserve his people through tribulation by becoming man. He would rescue humanity. In Daniel 7, we read this of Daniel's vision. We hear this title, Behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, the Father, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Here we see that he is both the sovereign king and the suffering servant. He took on flesh to live obediently in our place, which is why in verse 31 he says, The Son of Man must suffer many things. But not only would he suffer as the son of man, but he would be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. Now, these three groups made up what was known as the Sanhedrin in that time period. They almost acted uh, like the Jewish Supreme Court. So every community had elders that would serve kind of in civil law and make sure that everybody was kind of doing the right things and and judging uh, the way that they lived. The chief priests in that time, he's talking about the current chief priest and also those who had come before him would reject Jesus. And then finally, the scribes. These were like, you know, the expert lawyers, Bible teachers of that day. Now imagine how hard this would have been for the disciples. You were raised a Jewish, so your whole life you were taught to respect what these guys said. Uh, you were taught to live in the way that they, they guided you. And at the same time here, we see that they would reject Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, and that Christ would tell them that they would wrongfully reject him. And yet that rejection would be light compared to the suffering he would face in his death and in his execution. We go on here to see he was not only rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, but that he would be killed. After three days, he would rise again, but let us not gloss over the cross, the pinnacle of Christ's suffering. His mode of execution would be the most painful, that he would suffer and die on a Roman cross, that he would be beaten and flogged, that he would be whipped with a tool of torture that was braided with glass and hooks to rip the skin off of his back, that he would be killed and that he would suffer. He was mocked and he was spat upon. And as his eyes were almost swollen, completely shut, his executioners would hit him as hard as they could. And then they would ask an omniscient God, who punched you? After beating him, Uh, They laid the the cross upon his shoulders. Uh, They told him to attempt to carry his own tool of torture up a stony path. And then whenever he reached the top, iron spikes were driven through his hands and his feet. He was laid upon the cross beam and lifted above the earth. His body was positioned in such a way that the only way that he could breathe is by pulling himself up on the spikes that held him. And there he is, the king of glory, suffering in our place, wearing a crown of thorns upon his head. One of those first results you see from the fall in Genesis 3, he wore as a crown, both king of glory and suffering servant. Consider the cost of the cross and all that Christ has suffered for you. Maybe you almost feel what Peter felt in this moment. Peter hears this. All that would come, his rejection, and that he would be killed. And he says, no, no way, Jesus. And in Matthew's account, we, we see that he says, far be it from you, Lord. That's not going to happen. Right? He, he didn't want 
that path of suffering for Christ. He didn't have a full picture of who Christ was. And let's be honest for a little bit. He is starting to count the cost even in this moment because he knows if he is following Jesus and Jesus faces that kind of suffering, then he will be led there too. And so he rebukes Jesus. Well, then we see that Jesus, with an earshot of, of the disciples, rebukes Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan. And he makes this remark, this rebuke. He calls him Satan because this is the exact same temptation that Satan gave to Jesus in the wilderness. And he said, hey, if you bow to me, Jesus, if you forego the cross, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. I'll relinquish any power that I have in the world. And yet Jesus knew that the only path to salvation, the only path to the throne was through the cross. And so he would not take Satan's bribe and he would rebuke Peter as he utters the exact same offer that Satan made to him. You see, without the suffering of Christ, there is no hope for salvation. If you seek to sanitize the gospel, then you completely lose the gospel message. So we are those who cling to a bloody cross because there is no empty tomb without the death of Christ. You see, we must understand the, the cost of Christ's suffering so we understand how priceless God's grace is. See, our only hope to ever make it to God is not in our own effort, but that we would be carried there by his nail-scarred hands. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, no, this is, this is hard. This was the only way, and yet I want to tell you that this was necessary for you to have a relationship with God. Christ had to be both fully human and fully God. You see, only the Son of God taking on flesh could live a perfect life of obedience that we were commanded to live and yet could not. Christ had become fully human to represent us, and he had to be fully God to speak upon the behalf of who God is. Theologian John Stott says this, that all facets of the humanity of Christ suffered for sin so that Christ may be the savior of whole persons. Christ became what he sought to save. See, he had to be fully human. He had to be the son of man to save man. His death was necessary for two reasons, both for substitution and satisfaction. The, the wages of sin is death. God is uncompromising in, in the fact that the wages of sin is death. And every single one of us have committed sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gospel is the good news that that death does not have to be yours. And that Christ, in his perfection as an unblemished lamb, can be your substitute in the atonement. Not only is his death one of substitution, but it is one of satisfaction. God is a holy judge. The penalty of sin must be paid. And yet the reality of the gospel is that it doesn't have to be paid by you. But that the wrath of God could be satisfied in Christ, taking our sins upon himself and then bestowing his perfect sinless record to us, the great exchange, as theologians call it, propitiation, that Christ would be both substitute and the satisfaction for God's wrath. Unless you think that God is simply full of wrath and not loving and somehow Jesus just stepped in at the right moment, know that this was God's loving will to both crucify his son to save you and to resurrect his son to life. The third and final thing we see here is that Christ would rise after three days and the resurrection is necessary for your salvation. If Christ had simply died for a good cause, then he might be Messiah, but because he rose from the grave, or he might be a martyr, but because he rose from the grave three days later, he proves that he alone is the prophesied Messiah. He's the vindicated servant that we just read about from Isaiah 53. He is the son of man who is exalted in Daniel 7. He is the Lord who reigns eternally on the throne of David. The resurrection almost acts to us like a receipt that proves that Christ's payment was received and that the debt of our sins was paid completely in full. By defeating death, he proves 
that he has overpowered sin, Satan, and death by taking on sin's greatest consequence. And because Jesus lives, he can offer life. Think about that for just a moment. That because Christ is resurrected, because he is alive right now, seated on his throne, he hears your prayers. He builds his church. He intercedes for the sins that you will commit tomorrow. He upholds the universe. He can offer you a full life with God because the tomb is completely empty and will stay that way. And one day he will return. So may we not fall into the same error as Peter. We become short-sighted. We become focused on the things of man, as verse 33 says, instead of the things of God. What does it look like to fix our eyes upon the things of God and not the things of man? It is to count the cost which is what Jesus will teach his disciples about in verses 34 through 38. Read this with me, verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, now a crowd gathers around them, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here Jesus is challenging all who would follow him to count the cost of following him. Now, I want you to to see for a moment the breadth of the call of discipleship. Uh, There are three invitations that he makes here. To deny yourself, to take up your cross, and to follow me. But look at the invitation in verse 34. He says, if anyone would come after me. Yes, the gate is narrow and the path is hard. But anyone who trusts in the name of Christ will be saved. Which is why his invitation is anyone who can come after me. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Whether young or old, you grew up religious or not, rich or poor, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, which is why Christ says anyone who comes after me should deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now let's unpack these three commands that Christ gives as we see what it means to actually walk with God, to be a follower of Christ. He says to deny yourself, to turn away from the things of this world, to trade in the instant gratification that we're so often prone to seek for the ultimate gratification of enjoying God and walking with him. I find this convicting because I so often, I mean, I don't want to deny myself. I seek security in the things that the world has to offer. I want to build up my, you know, Dave Ramsey Financial Peace Emergency Fund, right? Because it offers me a little bit of cushion. I want to take a handful of vitamins every day because, by God's grace, I want to see my grandkids one day. And I saw a kid in diapers, you know? I mean, I got a long ways to go. I mean, I'm convicted by this because whenever I look around and I see that there are chairs full, I'm thinking, man, we, you know, after five years, it, it feels like, you know, we're, things are sustainable and things are going good. I mean, we want, we want to be wise as we consider the gifts of God and, and all that he gives us. And at the same time, we should use those gifts not to indulge ourselves, but to deny ourselves and to leverage our lives for the glory of God. So yes, if you have a well-paying job or financial security, leverage what God has given you to make the gospel go to the nations. If you're someone who is healthy, then serve those who are weak and are limited in strength. If you look around and you see a ministry growing that you're leading or you're a part of of the Oaks and you're like, man, I love being a part of this church. May that not be used to puff ourselves up, but to say there are a lot of people in this room and there are a lot of relationships we have. And by God's grace, those who are close to us, but far from God will call upon his name before we breathe our last breath. May we deny ourselves that others might know Christ. Not only that, Jesus says, take up your cross. Now listen, for, for those who were receiving this letter, the gospel of Mark, as he wrote it in the 60s, you know, 30 years after Christ had been resurrected, 
This was, this was real for them. They had been ostracized. They still saw people crucified on a regular basis. They experienced what it meant to be in Christ and an outcast in their own community. They knew what it meant to take up their cross and to follow Christ. And regardless of the cross that Christ has called you to bear, you can rest assured that he will be strong enough to place it upon his own shoulders. See, I know that some of you are carrying crosses. And as your pastor, I want to say, keep it up. He will sustain you. I know that some of you have been overlooked for promotions at your job because you've asked to have the majority of Sundays off so that you can be here for worship. I know that some of you get really strange looks when you ask to pray for your patients or your employees or students that you are counseling because people are like, why, why would you pray? Why, why would you do that in this moment? I know that, that some of you are sitting here and someone else has probably told you, just give up on your marriage. It's not worth it. It's too hard. You're too young. Find somebody else. And yet, because God has called you to a covenant commitment forever and for the good of your spouse and for the glory of God, you're going to stay in it and work to bring about gospel-centered change. Some of you are sitting there and you feel God nudging you to international missions or full-time ministry and you have no idea what that would look like or what those around you might think. And I want you to rest assured that you can carry your cross and boldly follow Jesus because he is immeasurably worth it. Which brings us to the third invitation he gives. Follow me. What does it mean for you to follow Jesus? It flows from knowing Jesus this is why Peter was upset, as I said before, right? Because he knows that if he's following Jesus and Jesus' path is one of suffering, then he knows that his life will be one of difficulty as well. I mean, may I remind you that Peter was so confident in his faith at the end of his life as an apostle that he would look upon his wife as she was martyred and encourage her in confidence in the Lord knowing that his life would soon be taken as well. I mean, how could, how could you have that kind of confidence? It's because he, he followed Jesus. He witnessed the resurrection. He knew who Christ was. And I love that this is the term of the Christian life, following Jesus, because it always reminds me of the relationship that Adam and Eve had with God in Genesis 1. What was it like? They were walking with Jesus. And what are the words that Jesus says to his disciples? Come follow me. Come walk with me. Come enjoy the relationship with God that you were intended to have. And that is the invitation we receive here to follow Jesus as we count the cost. In the early days of the Oaks, uh, whenever there were maybe 20 of us in a uh, meeting in the Oakley Rec Center, uh, around round tables there in the 20th century theater. A couple of you remember that day, uh, those days. Katie was there, Maria was there, Abby, you're obviously there. Uh, so I, I remember one, one day um, we were kind of getting ready to like, to like really start charging the hill and there were index cards on the table and I just, I told everybody, I want you to grab an index card and I want you to write the word yes on the index card. And then after you, you write the word yes, I want you to, to pray this prayer and ask God, what is the question? My answer is yes. God, what is the question? And then whatever that question might be, I want you to lay your yes on the table and say, Lord, you ask and I will follow. You ask and my answer will be yes, regardless of the cost. And maybe for some of you, that question that the Lord would ask, that you would answer yes to, would be to sell all of your possessions and move to a third world country that others who have never heard the name of Jesus might live forever. And for others of you, it will be what feels like the mundane, thankless self-sacrifice of changing your child's diapers so that they have a Christ-like example in the home of knowing what it means to follow Jesus. But our prayer to the Lord is you ask the question and my answer will be yes. We are those who, by God's grace, deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus. You see Jesus here in verse 35 gives a warning. 
For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. It is both a warning and a promise. The warning is this, that worldly self-preservation will produce an eternal condemnation. If you seek to preserve your life now, then you will lose it in eternity. Jesus here gives a frank warning, and there is no way to sugarcoat the unavoidable reality of Christ's words here. If you are more concerned with this world and what this world has to offer, then you prove that you do not belong to him. And I am seeking to say that to you with the greatest pastoral care that I can because I care about your soul. And so Jesus offers the question, what does it profit a man? If you would gain the world, if you would have everything that this life has to offer, and yet you would go into eternity not knowing him and lose your soul. The question he presents in verses 36 and 37 is, why would you seek to gain the world to lose your soul? There will be a day that your heart rate is a flat line. And on that day, the next billion years of eternity will be determined by the choices that you make here and now. Will you approach the throne of God with fear and regret, or will you enter into the presence of God with confidence and joy, hearing the words, well done, my good and faithful servant? You see, it was the missionary Jim Elliott who once wrote in his journal, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And he would be killed by the Harani tribe as he sought to share the gospel of Christ with them. And whenever he died, he would see absolutely none of them come to faith in Christ. And as discouraging as that might would be, his wife continued the work that those people might call upon the name of Christ. And by God's grace, many, if not all of them, would place their faith in Jesus. And today, right now, in this very moment, in a place that is unseen to us, the very people who took Jim's life are worshiping the Lord by his side in heaven today. That's how gracious God is. May we be those who etch that reality on our hearts that we will not be fools. If we lose in this world what we could never keep, to gain in Christ that which we could never lose. So what are you holding on to? Is it money? Is it security? Is it pleasure? Is it comfort? Is it your time? Is it your false sense of control? What would it look like for you to give up that you would gain Christ? Is the gospel calling you to be bold? with those neighbors that you often see but don't know their names? Is it to be more committed to your church family that you could be a part of building up your brothers and sisters in Christ? Is it to be joyful in what may feel like mundane obedience? Is it a next step of leadership in your Christian calling? Is it simply to be at peace with God's plans or to surrender your full agenda to full-time service and ministry? Whatever it is, the invitation is to embrace Christ and to enjoy a deeper relationship with him. Look at verse 38. Christ says, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here's the third thing that we see from this passage, that Christ invites us into the beautiful paradox of losing it all to gain everything. We may be rejected by this world. We may experience the shame of following Christ in relationship to others. And yet, if we embrace Christ and trust in him, we will not be ashamed when we stand before him in glory. There is this beautiful paradox in Christianity that by worldly standards, we might lose it all, but in Christ, we gain everything. You see, Jesus says that we are, if we are ashamed of him, then one day on the judgment day, he will be ashamed of us. Now, while this verse has been used to guilt many people for not sharing the gospel, I don't think that that is Jesus' main point here. Now, what he is saying is, if you do not associate with me now, if you do not cling to me, if you do not claim and trust in me now, then one day I will not associate with you. I mean, think of what the word ashamed means. Uh, John Piper puts it like this. He asks the question, what is, it, what is the opposite of being ashamed? It's to be proud of. 
is to say, hey, I know them and they know me, to associate with them. Imagine that you've been dating someone for a while and they invite you to, you know, their family reunion. And so you're saying, this is great. Things must be getting pretty serious. And so you're there with your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. And then they introduce you and they say, oh, this is my friend. And you're thinking, oh, I thought we were, I thought we were more than that. That kind of redefines the relationship a little bit. If they're ashamed to associate with you, then you're thinking, they must not love me like I thought they did. Well, in the same way, what Jesus is saying he is, hey, if you're ashamed of me, if you don't associate with me, if other people don't know that you call me Lord and Savior, then one day when you stand in my presence, I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. If you are ashamed of me now, then one day I will be ashamed of you. And while these words are designed by Christ to be smelling salts for the soul to wake us up, they are also filled with comfort and hope because the reality is if you do associate with Christ, if you cling to Jesus in the midst of your battle with sin, no matter how hard it is or in the midst of your suffering, that you can rest assured that one day you will stand in his presence and that he is ever present with you on this earth. We cling to the unshakable promise of Scripture made known to us in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, that this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Light momentary affliction compared to an eternal weight of glory that cannot be compared. So as we close, I want to tell you a couple things about the Christian life. The Christian life is one of calculated risk. It feels risky, but it's not because Christ is sure and certain and our faith is concrete. I remember whenever God, uh, I felt God calling me to ministry and this was the passage that I read and I pray that it's an encouragement to you. It was a devotional from Charles Spurgeon and I'm not saying that this is a call for every person in this room to become a pastor, but simply to follow Christ. It goes something like this that we should follow our Lord as unhesitatingly as sheep follow their shepherd, for he has a right to lead us wherever he pleases. Come prosperity or adversity, sickness or help, popularity or contempt, his purpose shall be worked out and that purpose shall be pure. We shall find it sweet to go up the bleak side of the hill with Christ. And when rain and snow blow into our faces, his dear love will make us far more blessed than those who sit at home and warm their hands at the world's fire. So to the dens of lions or to the hills of leopards, we will follow our beloved, precious Jesus, draw us, and we will run after thee. You will not trade what feels like risks in the Christian life for the joy of trusting him and depending on him ever. And my desire is that your faithful obedience and moments of following Christ in what feels like great risk would not be all in the past tense. I'm grateful that you used to lead young life or that you started a Bible study at your work four years ago, but what bold steps of faith are you taking now that is causing you to count the cost and find Christ immeasurably worth it? Not only that, the Christian life is one of no regrets. I'm not saying that you'll never second guess your decisions or that you will find yourself not having remorse over sin. I'm simply saying that you can give your life to God as a blank check and one day rest easy on your deathbed knowing that your life has been spent for the glory of God. And to live for Christ is to live with no regrets in your purity, your relationships, your marriage, your parenting, your time management, your finances, your skills, and whatever else God has given you. May we be those who count the cost and find Christ to be immeasurably worth it. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful for your word, Lord, the way that that you speak to us. Lord, as we have reflected on the cross of Christ and his suffering, may it overwhelm us. Lord, would you take any visual lethargy that we might have away from us? Lord, I pray that we would have clear eyes to see the glory of the gospel. Lord, I pray for those who are in this room that perhaps don't have a relationship with you, God, that that they would lay aside every sin which clings to them. Lord, that they would repent and confess that you are Lord and that they need you. Lord, I pray for those of us who have followed you for, for some time, be it a long time or a little time, Lord, that that we would see the glory of the gospel and 
Lord, that we would find you to be worth it. Lord, that you would reorient the expectations of the Christian life, that we would embrace difficulty or suffering knowing that you are worth it and that the suffering in this world is light and momentary compared to the glory that will one day be revealed in your presence. So Lord, may we be those who place our yes on the table and ask God, what's the question? I'll be faithful. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.